President Biden, who I've been around uh, numerous times just in this last year, is sharp, he's focused, he's bright. He is sharp, intensely probing, and detail-oriented and focused. This is a man who is sharp, who is on top of his game, who knows what's going on. He's smart, he's on his game. I was in almost every meeting with the president, and the president was in front of and on top of it all, coordinating and directing leaders who are in charge of America's national security, not to mention our allies around the globe. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. George Orwell, 1984. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to George Orwell's 2024. Clint Russell, <laughs> let's get into the show. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go? Does the White House think that the the idea of the president taking a cognition test, a cognitive test, as a part of this uh, physical is a legitimate idea, particularly just on the heels of the special counsel report, more polling, as my colleague Selena just mentioned, showing that many American people have concerns about that. Look, I got this question last week as well, and I'm just going to say what the what uh, Dr. O'Connor, it's kind of a uh, what he said to me about a year ago uh, when the report came out last year, uh, obviously on his physical, uh, which is the president proves every day how he operates, how he thinks, right? But by dealing with world leaders, by making really difficult decisions on behalf of the, the American people, whether it's domestic, whether it's national security. And so he shows it every day on how he thinks, how he operates. Uh, and so that is how, uh, that is how the, Dr. O'Connor sees it. And that's how I'm gonna leave it. Uh, taking that kind of a test. And I believe for me, you're asking me my personal opinion, uh, he is sharp. Uh, he is on top of things. He, when we have uh, meetings with him, with his staff, he's constantly pushing us, getting, trying to get more information. And so that has been my experience with this president. Uh, anything else outside of that, uh, I just shared with you what Dr. O'Connor said to me. Let us be very clear. If you are explaining the cognitive capacity of the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, as they say, you are already losing. You are absolutely losing. But I can spin this positively too. But first, let's make fun of it. <laughs> this man allegedly has access to the nuclear football. He is the commander in chief. He gets to decide whether or not we go to war. And you have all of the media sycophants going to all of the news channels and declaring loudly that the emperor does in fact have clothes. He is wearing clothes. He is not a man suffering from dementia, wandering around a park half naked. That is not what you're witnessing. What you are witnessing is a man with 50 years of tenure, the most experienced man for the job, the man who was to bring the adults back into the room, as they said, that the Trump administration was a disaster. We had to have professionalism once again. And now you have Joe Biden who can't remember the names of politicians he can't even remember if they're still alive. Guys who have been dead for decades, he doesn't remember. Multiple times in two weeks. This is not a joke, as Joe Biden would say. Not a joke. This is actually happening. Now, to, to spin this positively, Michael Malice made this point when Biden won the, the election, that it was going to be absolutely pants-shitting hilarity to watch his what we thought might be slow but is now at this point extraordinarily rapid degradation into a shell of a human being a a barely barely sentient potato which is what he currently is and man is it funny it is genuinely funny it'd be if it weren't for the fact that everything is so so deeply fucked up i wouldn't even worry about it but it's kind of important, given that, like, the dude <clears throat> who's tasked with avoiding World War III really doesn't know who's living and not. I'm not even certain he knows he's the president half of the days. 
And I'm not exaggerating. I honestly think he wakes up half the time and he thinks he's the vice president and he calls Barack and he says, Barack, everything's falling apart. What are we going to do? And Obama says, I got you, bud. You go back to bed. I'm going to handle it. But he's not really handling it very well. So, but here's, here's the silver lining. And I told you I'd spin this positively. Other than the fact that it's fucking hysterical. And it is. It's that the vast majority of Americans, for the longest time, forever, really, have always thought that the President of the United States is someone to aspire to, to look up to, is truly the leader of the free world, is really the difference between whether or not we succeed as a nation or fail. And what you're seeing, with all of its unvarnished glory, is that the President of the United States is not in charge, hasn't been in charge, for a very long time. And most importantly, I think it's waking a lot of people up to the fact that no one is coming to save us. And that's, that's not necessarily a positive message to, for most people to receive, but I think it's an empowering one. It's an important one. That if, if a guy who is obviously sundowning, sundowning who has obviously lost his cognitive faculties, is allegedly in this position of high prestige and power and authority, but is clearly dysfunctional, well, you have to realize that there's something else that actually makes this system go. And from my vantage point, it has been and continues to be the deep state, as Donald Trump would, would phrase it, military industrial complex, corporate interests, foreign lobbyists, World Economic Forum, globalist leaders, the, the, the whole litany of them. That's really what runs the system. But I think that too often the American people get caught up in red team, blue team. Uh, it's going to be Biden or it's going to be Trump. And uh, if, it's, if it's Biden, it's a disaster. If it's Trump, it's victory or vice versa. That's not really reality. And I think it becomes quite clear when you see a man who shits his, his pants in front of the Pope that like, oh, yeah, yeah, that like, no. Nah doesn't actually matter all that much. These guys don't actually have much power or say so. And perhaps we obsess a little bit too much over who will be the next president, given that clearly they are not in a position of ultimate authority. And perhaps we don't even want them to be. So that's the, that's the positive spin on this. But honestly, at some point, you just have to enjoy the ride, right? You just have to sit back and go, this is all fucking disastrous. But man, is it hysterical. And for that reason alone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take an optimistic outlook on this and say that millions and millions of Americans are waking up every day and realizing that the emperor has no clothes. He has been walking around like a naked homeless dude on a park bench, just screaming obscenities. And everyone's like looking around like, is anybody going to help? And the answer is no. No one's going to help. You're in it. You're in New York City. The cops aren't coming. It's up to you. Are you going to walk away from the homeless guy and actually decide to improve your life? Or are you going to walk towards the homeless guy and allow him to, you know, violate you? The answer is clear. Walk away. Walk away, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm telling you, this guy's tough. He's smart. He's on his game. And as Secretary Mallorca said a minute ago, when you go in to brief the president, you gotta, you better have your big boy <laughs> pants on. And and this kind of sense that he's not ready for this job is just a bucket of BS that's so Un deep, your boots will get stuck in. Yeah, uh, understood. But but Americans don't agree with what you're saying. In fact, our NBC News poll found that 76 percent of voters are concerned about whether the president has the necessary mental and physical health to be president for a second. Term. And I'm telling you, this guy's tough. So I think that the, the primary takeaway should be that every single person go, hitting the national news circuit and telling you that Biden is doing just great, peak of physical and mental health, you need to, you need to recognize these people for what they are. They are apparatchiks. They don't have any actual capacity to think for themselves, or if they do, they've completely you know, diminish that factor within themselves to just push a narrative that they know. They all know that they're lying to you. They don't care. But I want you to really pay attention to who's saying it because you should dismiss everything they say from this point for the rest of eternity. 
These people are pathological liars. They're not concerned with your well-being. It couldn't be more clear. Do I have to emphasize this any more than I already have? I don't think so. Let's move on. Let's talk about your cable ace award. Let's talk about buttered seven. sausage. Talk about buttered sausage, where it comes from, what it does. Why is it doing what it's doing? Get it out of my face. What about <laughs> buttered? Buttered, buttered sausage? That's not your jam. It's not your thing. You don't like it? It's not my jam. I don't buy jam. I buy honey, and I kiss it on the lips. <laughs> Honestly, like I would, I would prefer that Gary Busey be the president of the United States and Joe Biden at this point. All right. All right. I'm done. I'm done picking on Biden. Let's keep moving. President Joe Biden has been portrayed by his political opponents and even some of his allies as too old to be president. I'm not asking for your political opinion here, but how does he seem to you? Look, at, uh, I'm not going to comment. I didn't comment on the former president's uh, mental health, physical health, and, and, and I'm not going to comment on the current president's mental health or physical health. I think that's highly inappropriate for the uh, senior officer of the United States military to, to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just tell you that uh, I meet frequently with the president, um, and every single time I meet with him, um, he, he is just fine. How people interpret that is up to them, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's comforting, right? This is this is the same General Mark Milley who had back channels to China during Trump's presidency where he was telling them that he would belay all orders to start a war against them if, if Trump were to tell him to do so. Uh, so apparently he's got a... a, a it, it'd be inappropriate for him to comment on Biden's mental health, but, you know, totally fine to communicate with Chinese leadership uh, as to whether or not the commander-in-chief has delivered him an order that would catalyze war. Uh, which, by the way, generally I don't have a problem with because I'd rather there be checks and balances in the military to actually make some sort of uh, you know, logical analysis as to whether or not an order makes sense. But in the case of Mark Milley, I believe that he's in fact, uh, well, I can't really say it on here, but he is not in alignment with the Constitution or American values, and he actively works to subvert them. So... You can assess what I, my my belief on him. All right, I, I I promised we'd be done picking on Biden, but there's one more clip that just absolutely drove me out of my mind, and I need to break it down. This is Joe Biden during the Super Bowl talking about inflation. The Super Bowl is Sunday. If you're anything like me, you like to be surrounded by a snack or two while watching the big game. You know, when buying snacks for the game, you might have noticed one thing: sports drinks bottles are smaller. A bag of chips has fewer chips, but they're still charging it just as much. And as an ice cream lover, what makes me the most angry is that ice cream cartons have actually shrunk in size, but not in price. I've had enough of what they call shrinkflation. It's a ripoff. Some companies are trying to pull a fast one by shrinking the products little by little and hoping you won't notice. Give me a break. The American public is tired of being played for suckers. I'm calling on companies to put a stop to this. Let's make sure businesses do the right thing now. Jesus Christ. Uh, all right. So I've, I've got to break that down for you a little bit. I'm sure most of you already understand it. First off, talk about pot calling the kettle black, huh? Saying they're, 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 hope, they're hoping that you won't notice. Like kind of like how you're hoping that we won't notice that the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is, you know, decreasing quite rapidly. But little by little, hoping that we won't notice. Yeah, we noticed, Joe. We noticed, okay, bud? I just can't believe that this dude... <laughs> I can't believe that this dude... Like, why would they even do these videos? Just put him back in the basement. Hide him from us. Don't allow him to speak. It's crazy to have him as a propagandist on, on any topic at all. Especially shrinkflation. Th this is what's so infuriating to me. The, the portrayal is if this is some sort of free market phenomenon. No, 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 no. These are businesses that are reacting to... The fact that their consumer can no longer afford their product, so they 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 decrease the amount of goods within the actual, you know, container or whatever, but keep the price the same because they don't want to raise the prices. If they keep the same amount of, of product within the packaging, because of inflation, they're going to have to charge more just to cover the cost because their input costs have accelerated because of inflation, because of the central bank's, uh, you know, profligate spending or printing, I should say, and. It's it's gaslighting to the extreme that this could be portrayed in any form as a free market issue, as greed. I mean, shrinkflation. Just consider, just think about this rationally. If you're 
a corporation that sells a product, do you want to upset the consumer? No, you don't. In fact, that's what shrinkflation is. It's an effort not to upset the consumer. They're trying to essentially make you think that you're paying the same price for the same amount because the alternative is to raise the price and have you opt for a competitor's brand. So they're, this is directly a consequence of financial policy from the central banks as well as Congress who spent trillions of dollars over the past you know, few years and just sent it to the wealthiest amongst us. So this is a product of Biden's policies as well as Jerome Powell and Trump and you know all of the printing that's happened throughout my lifetime. It's not, it's not entirely on Biden, but to pretend as if this is about corporate greed and that they need to do the right thing, corporations are not gonna run at a loss, Joe. I know that you you think that like the government can run at a loss infinitely, so of course corporations can too. You're wrong though. You're wrong. They actually have to try and turn a profit because they're actually in business. I know. It's a foreign concept to someone who's been in politics for 50 years and has no fucking clue how to balance the budget, but it's kind of incumbent upon corporations to do so. Otherwise, they go out of business. It's gaslighting to the extreme, and I am none too pleased with it. Speaking of gaslighting, Nikki Haley, in light of the Tucker Putin interview, tries to reframe and rewrite history. But I do think we should support Ukraine, and I do think we should give them the equipment and ammunition to win. Because listen to Putin's own words. He said once he takes Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries, and that puts America at war. Can you imagine a scenario where you sent Russian troops to Poland? Only in one case, if Poland attacks Russia. Why? Because we have no interest in Poland, Latvia or anywhere else. Why would we do that? We simply don't have any interest. It's just threat mongering. Well, the argument, I know you know this, is that, well, he invaded Ukraine. He has territorial aims across the continent. And you're saying unequivocally you don't. It is absolutely out of the question. You just don't have to be any kind of analyst. It goes against common sense to get involved in some kind of a global war. And a global war will bring all humanity to the brink of destruction. It's obvious. This is about preventing war. That's the important reason why we have to support Ukraine. They have been scaring everyone with us all along. Tomorrow Russia will use tactical nuclear weapons. Tomorrow Russia will use that. No, the day after tomorrow. So what? In order to extort additional money from US taxpayers and European taxpayers in the confrontation with Russia in the Ukrainian theater of war. It's important that you understand the reality of the situation. <clears throat> I know a lot of people got upset with me for saying that I think that Putin is telling the truth to a large extent, more, more so than any American uh, politician of the past few years. Uh, but I think that if you actually look at his actions and his words compared to the on the ground analysis of what's transpiring, if you listen to Colonel Douglas McGregor, if you listen to any anybody who's actually been right with their analysis of the Ukraine war, Putin is telling the truth. He has no aspirations. Contrary to what Nikki Haley is saying there, he has never once said that he has any aspirations to move on Poland or NATO territory more broadly. He realizes quite realistically that it would constitute a world war, which is existential for all of us. I take this as a good thing, that at least there is one political leader amongst this morass of corrupt, murderous tyrants that is actually talking about this honestly and being rational in his analysis. But I think that the important takeaway is that the entire framing from the American political establishment is deceit. It is a lie. They are, it's whole cloth fiction. They have made it up and they have continued to push this narrative for two years that if we don't defeat Putin in Ukraine, well then Poland's next. The whole reason we have to continue to fund Ukraine is because we don't want a wider war. They're lying to you. Could it be any more obvious that they're lying to you? That is not what's happening here. 
There's there's a litany of reasons. In fact, I explained in in detail on my Twitter. If you want to go check it out, I can't talk about a portion of it on YouTube, but there are a multitude of reasons that that seem to be much more plausible from the origin. I'll just say that uh, to obviously military industrial complex funding to the BlackRock you know, intention to get the contracts for rebuilding. They've essentially taken over as the government in Ukraine already, and obviously they want to prevail so that then they can have the contracts for rebuilding. The World Economic Forum meetings have talked about this continuously too, that we need to have this, this pairing of private capital with governments to ultimately rebuild Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It isn't going to happen. Ukraine is not going to win this war. I don't I don't say that with any joy. It's sad. Hundreds of thousands of young men and some women, I'm sure, have perished untimely. It's absolutely horrific. It does not change the reality of the situation. The the American political establishment has tried to tell you that unless Ukraine regains control of Crimea, this war cannot end. There can be no peace negotiations. Well, the reason that they've given you that parameter for whether or not peace can ever be found or maintained is because they know it will never happen. They want this to be an endless war, just like they wanted and made Afghanistan into an endless war. And then they just transitioned about six months after the Afghanistan war ended into this endless money pit in Ukraine. Also, they're trying to defend the U.S. dollar. Because they pulled the nuclear sanction uh, lever when it comes to Putin and Russia, kicking them off of SWIFT and, and stealing hundreds of billions of dollars from their central bank, they have made it so that this is everything that they can do. They are arming Ukraine to the end of the earth. They funded Ukraine to the end of the earth. And they also pulled the entire nuclear sanction lever. If they can't win in that methodology. That means that only NATO troops and hot conflict can actually be utilized to prevail in terms of global hegemonic control. That is evidence that the empire is essentially toothless because the American people will not fight in this world war that they're trying to bring us into. So if the sanction regime doesn't work, well, that means that the rest of the leaders of the foreign nations all over the world are looking at this right now saying, who do I want to be aligned with? The old guard, the old global hegemon in the American empire, or do I want to align myself with the BRICS alliance that has billions and billions of people, has a huge percentage of global GDP, ultimately uh, behaves in a way that's much less militaristic and uh, you know punitive when it comes to sanctions and things like that. The answer for many of these nations and many of the leaders of these nations, given what's happened to Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi and a litany of others, they're going to migrate into the BRICS alliance away from the Western NATO-led alliance. You're watching it in real time. This is why Ukraine matters so much to them. The last item of, that I, I, of my contention is that this has always been a NATO expansion since 91 has been about encircling Russia in hopes of ultimately breaking them up into a bunch of little puppet states for the American empire so that then they could migrate their containment strategy from Russia to China. That's my analysis. I can't say definitively that's the case, but it certainly looks like it to me because China is obviously the, the rising global superpower and that's that's been the game plan from the western world order so that's it that's why this matters on top of that you have the unbelievable corruption from the american political class when it comes to business dealings in inside of ukraine as well with china and russia and many other nations but ukraine has kind of been the hotbed so there's a there's a lot of reasons a lot of reasons that i just gave you that are very valid as to why the american political class wants to go to the mat for Ukraine and send hundreds of billions of dollars and all of the weapons and totally deplete our arsenal and totally deplete the American morale and, uh, you know, inflate us into oblivion. But guess what I didn't list? 
the defense of democracy. Because if you've actually looked at Ukraine's political maneuvers over the past few years, the last thing you could accuse them of is being a pinnacle example of democracy. It is not about defending democracy. You can dismiss that. And when you see people like Nikki Haley continue to push the lie, all of the lies, you know what the truth is. The truth is not what they're telling you. Here's Putin with Tucker, followed by Mitt Romney lying about what is being said and being discussed when it comes to this matter. Tomorrow, Russia will use tactical nuclear weapons in order to extort additional money from U.S. taxpayers. And they're trying to intimidate their own population with an imaginary Russian threat. This is an obvious fact. Can you imagine a scenario where you sent Russian troops to Poland? Only in one case, if Poland attacks Russia. Why? Because we have no interest in Poland, Latvia or anywhere else. Why would we do that? We simply don't have any interest. It's just threat mongering. If we fail to help Ukraine, Putin will invade a NATO nation. If we fail to help Ukraine, NATO the alliance has prevented great power conflict for over 75 years, will falter and eventually disintegrate. We will be replaced by the authoritarians, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Next, we were told that we couldn't afford $60 billion for Ukraine-related funding. But somehow we can afford an $850 billion annual defense budget and annual trillion-dollar deficits which has happened under both former President Trump and President Biden. So yeah, they're lying. I know, spoiler alert. <laughs> Probably don't need to explain that to you guys. Um, but it's, it's very consistent. The reason this matters is that this morning, actually late last night or overnight, the Senate passed a $95 billion funding bill to Taiwan, Ukraine, Israel some humanitarian assistance to the Palestinians. Uh, it has not it has not passed in the House yet, though. The Senate passed it. I don't know why it's happening in reverse. I thought it usually happens in the House, but whatever. And the, the House of Representatives is currently saying that, or the Speaker Mike Johnson is saying that because it has no, no concerns for the border, the American border, the only one that they ought to care about, they are not going to bring it to a vote. However, uh, some Senator Mullins, or I don't, I forget what his name, Mark Wayne Mullins, I'm not familiar with him, but he's trying to pull some real shenanigans and make it so that they can bypass the speaker's decision on whether or not to bring it to a vote. If they do so, if the House of Representatives decides to pass, well, we're barely able to afford groceries. If they pass a $95 billion an additional proxy war funding for a bunch of nations, two of which have a lower debt to GDP ratio than America, while doing absolutely fuck all to address the border issue and the five to 10 million illegal immigrants that came across over the past year, the over 1 million illegals that have come across over the first six months of this year, just consider what that pace is and what that means for the remainder of fiscal year 2024. If they do so, I think it will radicalize the American people to an extent that is totally beyond the pale. I I could be wrong. Maybe people are are still totally ignoring it. But I think that more and more as these issues with the fentanyl crisis, to the inflationary pressures, to the homelessness, to the drug issues, uh, I think that more and more people are starting to realize that the American political establishment does not represent us. They are not concerned with us, our well-being, or anything to that extent. They clearly work for foreign powers and they have essentially no allegiance to the American people or the desire of their constituents. And lest I remind you, our founders talked about this quite openly, that one of their major grievances was taxation without representation. Do you feel represented? Do you feel represented? I haven't felt represented my entire life, but I'm a lunatic libertarian. It doesn't really matter what I think. What matters is, what do you think, Mr. Slightly More Normal Human Being? Do you feel as if you're being represented? Because I don't know anybody 
that feels as if they're being represented from either side of the political aisle, whether you stand with Palestine or you don't want to see World War III or you can't afford your groceries or you can't afford housing or your rent or you can't walk down the street without seeing someone laying on the sidewalk with a needle hanging out of their arm or your kids are dealing with gender dysphoria or your kids are dealing with depression and anxiety because of the lockdowns and the masking or you lost your job because you believed in bodily autonomy i could keep going this is a this is a very limited list off the top of my head of absolutely righteous grievances that the american people have absolutely righteous and what is their priority 95 billion in additional funding to foreign nations in proxy wars against other nations that we probably can't even beat in a hot war. Extraordinarily perilous and ultimately detrimental to the domestic population in a way that I hope, I hope, means that the American people will eventually say, I've had enough. Now, I know many in my audience are not fans of Tucker Carlson. I'm not really sure why you're not. I think that he's been arguably the greatest journalist over the past few years but if you hate the guy you may want to tune out for this segment this is the first conversation or the first interview that tucker carlson did post putin interview he did it at the world government summit uh just a, a day ago and i honestly thought it was one of the most impressive interviews i've seen from really anyone in the you know, political media apparatus, it, like really, really profound stuff. So I'm going to be very complimentary towards him. So if you have a problem with that, you may want to tune out or just dismiss my comments and get angry about it and, and hate watch it. But I think this is really worth watching and listening to. The, uh, I'll start in reverse order. Why now? Well, I've been trying for three years to do this interview. Um, the U.S. government prevented me from doing it by spying on my text messages and leaking them to The New York Times. And that spooked the Russian government into canceling the interview. So I've been trying to do this, but my country's intel services were working against me illegally. And that enraged me because I'm an American citizen. I'm 54. I pay my taxes. I obey the law. And there was no expectation in the America that I grew up in that my government and its intel services, NSA and CIA, which were always outwardly focused on our foreign enemies, would be turned inward against American citizens. And I'm shocked by that, and I'm infuriated by that. And so once I discovered that that was happening, and I confirmed it was happening, and they admitted that they did it, then I was totally determined, monomaniacally dedicated to doing this interview, not simply because I want to know uh, what Vladimir Putin is like and what he thinks about a war that is resetting the world and really gravely damaging my country's economy, but also because they told me I couldn't on the basis of illegitimate means um, and for no really clearly stated justification. And I thought that can't stand. I don't, I want to live in a free country. I was born in one and I'm going to do whatever small thing I can do to maintain, um, you know, the society that. That was such, such a powerful opening statement as to why he did it. And this is going to be very, this is going to be a very patriotic rant. So. If you're not feeling patriotic, again, you might want to tune out, but <clears throat> especially people in the, in the GOP, they oftentimes will talk about American exceptionalism and oftentimes it's, it's, it's paired or tied to our military prowess, our military might, we're the policemen of the world and we bring democracy and prosperity all over the world, all these fucking lies. But there is something about America and American exceptionalism that I do believe in. And I believe it's, it's real. And I think it can be boiled down to a fairly simple saying. And I'll, I'll, I'll quote one of the now worst, most woke uh, rock bands out there, Rage Against the Machine. And it's, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Now I want to sing the song. Look, that is what American exceptionalism is. It really is. It's the rebellious spirit that gets me out of bed every morning that says, I will not be broken. I will not be beaten down by tyrants. And if you give me unjust commands, I will dismiss them entirely. And I think that more than anything 
is what gives me a fondness towards the Tucker Carlson's of the world and the Julian Assange's of the world. Those that are willing to push back against the state, which is behaving in an incredibly tyrannical fashion, and say, I'm going to risk everything because the alternative is untenable. The alternative is actually worse. With whatever threat you're levying against me, this is about maintaining the foundational liberal, in the, in the old sense, the, the good sense, liberal values about free speech, the right to protest, things like that, journalists or uh, you know, press rights. Like I'm willing to risk everything because I want my children to grow up in a country like that. And I think that's what makes Americans special, not America. Americans are special because, as I've said many times, we are the progeny of the most obstinate, psychotically independent, risk-taking people that have ever lived. Those that would sail across the Atlantic hundreds of years ago when you had like a maybe 10% chance of dying. And they're just like, we're going to do it anyways. You know why? Because we want religious freedom. Because we want to be able to speak freely. Because we want out from taxation that's, that's overbearing. Real, real psychopaths. You know all those libertarians that moved to New Hampshire, the Free State Project? That's what, to a large extent, what all of America was founded by. Bunch of fucking lunatics that were like, I'm going to move across the planet with no expectations of what is on the other side of it because I don't like my circumstances here and I'm going to see what I can do with a little bit of freedom over there. And Tucker, despite all of his failings in his past, he has still held on to that and he appears to be responding to increasing tyranny with what I want to see from more people in America, which is a willingness to have at least a little bit of risk, a little bit of self-sacrifice to try and hold on to these hard fought values, to, to fight for something that is bigger than yourself, to believe in something that's bigger than yourself. He has that. It's so clear. What he's risking in doing this is astronomical. People think that it's, you know, oh, he's, he's just going to go over there. He's going to interview him. He's going to come back. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe the entire FBI, CIA, NSA spying apparatus, the same entities which already tried to derail this interview, spent two years trying to dis derail it by spying on his private text messages and ultimately blowing up the, the first interview two years ago before the invasion, which I think is not an accident. They did not want him to be on record with a large audience with Vladimir Putin talking about his grievances that led to this war. He still, he still forged on. He still said, I will not be stopped. This matters more. Telling the truth matters more. I want to convey to the American people what this war is about, where their money is going, what risks are being levied upon not just themselves, but their children. I want people to be knowledgeable. That is, that is the, the most important fundamental value of legitimate journalism. And I, I genuinely believe you can disagree with me if you want. I and, and drop it in the comments. I'll argue with you about it later. I genuinely believe that America or that Tucker Carlson is the greatest living journalist in America. What he did, the risks that he took on voluntarily to go do this interview with Vladimir Putin, despite all of the angst and anger and animosity that he's now receiving from the rest of the corporate media, as well as the political class. And God knows what's happening behind the scenes. The fact that he was willing to forge on and risk that because he felt that the story was too important, that the risks were too great, that a conversation like this could prevent a catastrophe, heroic, absolutely heroic what he did. And I, for one, am appreciative and I feel indebted to him for having done so. Tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me why that doesn't deserve some respect. I think it does. Let's continue with the interview. Today's episode of Liberty Lockdown is brought to you by Nadeau Shave Co. 
Eliminate razor burn irritation and ingrown hairs caused by deep penetrating multi-blade cartridges. You don't need expensive plastic replacement cartridges. Nadeau Shave Coast supplies you with a single stainless steel blade like your grandfather used to use. High quality razor blades for a precise and clean shave. The chrome plated Swedish stainless steel blades guarantee a long lasting razor. Made of electro plated brass, the twist to open handle found on our traditional safety razors makes changing blades a snap. Whether you're shaving your entire face or just edging up your beard, their single blades provide a barber grade shave for a fraction of the price. Their standard issue includes traditional safety razor and a box of 100 stainless steel razor blades, plastic free, 100% recyclable. $75 allows you to shave for an entire year. You heard that right. N-A-D-E-A-U shaveco.com. And for those who like to use a brand new blade for each shave, sign up for their quarter shave club. Members receive a major discount and pay 25 cents a shave. Take down Big Shave and visit N-A-D-E-A-U shaveco.com. Promo code LOCKDOWN. Get yourself the best razor in the game at the best price. Nadeau, shaveco.com. You are, you are known to be um, pro-Republican party right wing of the republican party <laughs> this is what they claim they said first you've been a democrat <laughs> that's not then true became a republican okay or you are known to be pro-trump anti-biden what is truthful in this and you went to putin because you are pro-trump and anti-biden um i mean my views are not very interesting uh, I would, I'm not sure how I'd characterize them. They're changing as quickly as the world itself is changing. And I, as a matter of principle, I, I think that, you know, that your views should change when the evidence changes and assumptions that you had in the past are proven wrong. That has ha happened to me virtually every month of my life. If you pay close enough attention, you can rate your own performance, just as if you're betting on sports. You know, I lost that one. And when you do, when it turns out that the things you thought were true were lies, you should admit it. So. What are my views? I'm not certain. Tell the truth is my main view, and I plan to do that to the best of my ability. So um, Trump played no role in this whatsoever. There's a, obviously an election in my country coming uh, to fruition in November. I have no idea what's going to happen. I think that the current administration is very obviously incompetent, and the, the president is senile. That's not an attack. Everyone knows it. Um, it has now been confirmed, I, I, I would say, this week uh, in in the report that you're all familiar with. But, um, and that's very sad, but it, it had sort of nothing to do with the interview. I wanted to interview Putin because he's the leader of a country that the US government is sort of at war with, though not in a, in a declared way. Uh, just a quick interlude on this part. You know, this is the main reason that when I was moderating that debate in uh, Georgia two weeks ago, I asked about you know whether or not people got the jab and whether or not they felt good about it was again just to clarify not to shame them but rather exactly what tucker explained right there i think it's very good it's very human to analyze our decision making and then decide if it was the proper course of action and if it wasn't why who lied to us why you know have you evolved i think this is what uh, another aspect of of you know why i respect tucker carlson is that he has shown an ability to maintain you know cognitive pliability when it comes to new information the fact that he's been willing to apologize for his advocacy for the war on terror or more specifically the invasion of iraq in 2003 the fact that he now laments that openly is apologetic for it like this is this is exactly what i've asked when it came to the lockdown regime is like I am not a vindictive person to the extent that I want to see everyone responsible for that tyranny to suffer eternally. As much as I want to see genuine remorse, I just want to see that you are actually reflecting on what transpired and why, and your, the role that you played in it. Tucker Carlson has done so consistently for years now. He has, he has demonstrated to me quite clearly that he is reflecting on who he once was and who he wants to be, what he wants to see in the world, how he can help in that process. These are all things like these are things that I want to see more of broadly. Why would I not offer the same grace to someone like Tucker? You see the two men now uh, running the world. I mean, if this were boxing, the fight would be called by the medic. Um... So, and I say that as an American, and I'm, I don't have another passport. I don't plan to ever leave my country. My family's been there hundreds of years, and I love it. I am a patriotic American. 
And I grieve when I see that the president is non compass menace. And that in my country, it is considered very rude to say that. And you sort of wonder, how did you get to a place where you have an incompetent president who's driven not simply the standard of living, but life expectancy downward, and no one feels free to say that? That's not a political observation. It's a statement of fact, which is provable empirically. And the most radicalizing thing I would just say for me in the eight days I spent in Moscow was not simply the leader of the country, who of course is impressive. It's the largest land mass in the world. And it's wildly diverse, linguistically, culturally, religiously. It's hard to run a country like that for 24 years, whether you like it or not. So an incapable person couldn't do that. He is very capable, and many of you know him, and you know that. What was radicalizing, very shocking, and very disturbing for me was the city of Moscow, where I'd never been, the biggest city in Europe, 13 million people. And it is so much nicer than any city in my country. I had no idea. My father spent a lot of time there in the 80s when he worked for the US government and barely had electricity. And now it is so much cleaner and safer and prettier aesthetically. It's architecture, it's food, it's service than any country, city in the United States that you have to, and this is not ideological, how did that happen? How did that happen? And at a certain point, I don't think the average person cares as much about abstractions as about the concrete reality of his life. The reason that I'm a libertarian is because I believe that, that liberty ultimately delivers to the collective Individual liberty delivers to the collective the highest levels of safety, security, prosperity across the board. I think it is, is, it is preferable to all other models of governance, not just because it's moral and philosophically sound, but rather because it al also, from a consequentialist you know, vantage point, it delivers the best outcome to civilization broadly. And I think that oftentimes libertarians will get trapped in this philosophical realm and ignore the outcomes on the ground to their detriment. And ultimately, I think that it, it def it's self-defeating. It makes the, the rest of the world, or just in, in this instance, I'm just talking about Americans. So the rest of the people in America will look at libertarians and they will say, well, Drugs got legalized in San Francisco, and now homelessness and drug addiction is rampant. This is all your fault. And if libertarians just go, drugs should be legal, and that's all they have to say about it, well, then we sound crazy. Like, I, I firmly believe that the war on drugs has been a failure. I firmly believe that drugs ought to be legalized. But if I'm not willing to deal in reality to look at the circumstances and to explain exactly why drug legalization has gone so terribly poorly in these Democrat-led states, well, then it's pretty self-defeating, right? Because then the rest of the American people are looking at me like, dude, San Francisco is melting down, Portland is melting down, any of these places where they allow or de they decriminalize or they stop prosecuting people for, you know, these crimes, it, it is... It's disastrous. Why are you not willing to deal in reality? I think it's very important that we deal in reality. And every time that there's an example of this, there is a certain segment of the libertarian community that will just go, drugs should be legal, you tyrant. As opposed to actually explaining what other things need to happen. This actually ties in perfectly to the immigration debate, which has been rampant over the past uh, week on Twitter thanks to the interview I did with Dave Smith. And once again, I think this is why it's very important that we deal in reality. Like, why are our cities unlivable? Why are the cities that are under governance models that are even less preferable to the American model, why are they thriving? Why are they clean? Why are they safe? Well, our, ours degrade into Mad Max level psychosis. Well, in my opinion, it's because there's still enormous governmental problems that are exacerbating these issues. Just as having a huge social safety net and open borders is insane. Having a military empire that has blown up countless nations over the past 30 years and then just throwing the border wide open is insane, as is funding the United Nations, which has an immigration plan where they are funding through NGOs 
the flood of immigrants that we're talking about right now. So having U.S. taxpayer dollars going to assist with this mass flood of migrants while simultaneously having no federal government response to the border and also forbidding states from addressing the border issue, contrary to the demands of the people that live there domestically. All of this is insane. It is government created top to bottom. It is a government issue. But libertarians, those that ought to be most privy to what's transpiring, those that ought to be most aware as to why this is actually coming to fruition, instead of explaining all of this, which obviously takes more time, it's much more complex, it's not easy, but it's vitally important because the alternative is to say, libertarians don't believe in states' rights, they don't believe in states' borders, yada, 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 that's it. You give no further explanation. And they look at you like, dude, 10 million people came across over the past 12 months. What are you fucking talking about? This is okay with you? And if you say yes, you've lost them forever. They will never listen to you on anything again. And you know what? I'm not sure that they should. Because you're not dealing with reality. You're not dealing with the circumstances on the ground. You aren't the people that are in Texas, the, the mid or lower class people that are in Texas that can't afford to rent a property because migrants have all come in to the tune of millions, millions. And you're just going to say, you tyrant, you status, you believe in, you know, state borders. Ugh, you, you disgust me. Okay, why, why should they listen to you? The answer is obvious. They shouldn't. You're not, you're not concerned with their very legitimate concerns. Just as if you look at the, the homelessness issue and you say, well, you know, public, public property shouldn't exist. This shouldn't be an issue. It is an issue. It is an issue because public property does exist because that's what the government dictates. They're not going to sell off all the public lands. They're not going to sell off all the public parks or the schools or anything like that. Not, not anytime soon. So are you just going to say, well, drugs ought to be legal, so you can't do anything about this? The answer, as Dave said, should be not that. That if you're going to actually make the pitch for liberty, you have to be dealing in reality. And I think that when you travel the world, as Tucker Carlson is doing, and he's looking at all these major metropolitan cities, and they're clean, and the homelessness issue is not crazy, and the drug addiction is not crazy, that if you, if you refuse to deal in reality, you are going to have a huge, huge percentage of the American people that say, give me a right wing dictator. Give me a strong man nationalist. Shut down the border forever. Throw everybody who's a nonviolent drug offender in prison for 30 years. Go full Singapore with this. Lash people. All sorts of craziness, right? Is that where you is that what you want to live under? Because I don't. I personally do not. So I'm encouraging you guys to have a little pragmatism, a little realism as to what we're dealing with and why. Are you willing to to take the harder path of expl like for the for the uh, first off? I don't think most people, even in my community understand the depth of this immigration issue, which is why I've gone out of my way to explain it as much as I have, that this is a globalist plan. It is. Look up Immigration 2030 United Nations. Look it up. Read it, for God's sakes. Understand that there are NGOs that are ushering this into reality, that are being fucking funded by your taxes. Taxation is theft. You have a problem with that, right? Okay, good. Now extrapolate. Why is it happening? Is it organic? Is this just f people are free to travel and that's it. There's, that's the only answer you have. Well, then you're fucking useless. Do you understand? Do you understand how useless that is right now? Because you're going to lead to the rise of a strongman dictator. You absolutely are. We still live under a democratic system, do we not? Are the American people not going to just go, give me a lunatic that will address this issue. That's what they're going to do. I'm telling you right now, that's what they're going to do. And I'm not even going to be able to blame them because instead of actually addressing their very legitimate grievances, we're just going to 
call them statists and laugh them off. It's stupid. It has been stupid for years. It gets exceedingly stupid if we continue, uh, continue to ignore them. All right, let's go back to the Tucker interview. Filth, graffiti, Paris, one of my favorite cities, New York, one of my favorite cities are filthy. And part of the reason they're filthy is because people spray paint obscenities on buildings and no one cleans it up. So that encourages more people to do the same. And our policymakers, for some reason, don't notice this. London, another one of my favorite cities. You see English girls begging for drugs on the sidewalk. And I thought to myself, if I'm Boris Johnson, who briefly and very badly ran that country, I would ask myself, like, wait a second, my countrymen are begging for drugs on the street. Maybe I should do something about that. But no, he'll show up and give some speech about Ukraine and how we need to send, you know, more cluster bombs to the brave Ukrainians. Now, you would it be... Just a you know thought experiment or, or an example of what I was talking about earlier. Would it be more beneficial to just lecture Tucker on how people have bodily autonomy and that they ought to be able to use drugs as long as they're not hurting anybody, given what he's describing now? Filthy cities, homelessness out of control, drug addicts strewn all, of, all across the street. Or would it be better to explain to him how central banking is in fact largely responsible for the degradation of civilization? Would it be better to explain how the public schooling system is ultimately breaking people in terms of their their mindset? That it's, it's making it so that entrepreneurialism is less and less commonplace, that the taxation is making it so that people don't want to go into business for themselves, that, that hopelessness starts to mount upon itself because of the inflationary pressures that people give up, that the lockdowns ultimately were psychologically defeating in a way that's really astronomical, that the drug addiction is a consequence of so many governmental policies, and that ultimately having some sort of strongman right-winger come in to alleviate all this is ultimately not going to get you where you want to go. I think, even though, as I just said, it's a much lengthier explanation, and there's much more to it. Psychological warfare, uh, CIA being responsible for much of this drug running. I mean, you can go very, very deep. But if you take the superficial route and you just say, people have bodily autonomy, they ought to be able to do drugs, Tucker, he's going to dismiss you. And he should. Because it's very important that you actually address his concerns. And, and for the record, if you don't share his concerns, I would encourage you to go to San Francisco. I'm a California born and raised native for 35 plus years. Trust me when I tell you, it is a disaster. Go to, go to Los Angeles. Hell, go to my hometown of San Diego. Go to downtown San Diego and walk around and look at people completely incapacitated, unconscious, as drug needles literally hang from their arms. It breaks my heart. This is my hometown, man. It is tragic. But I watched it just grow and grow and grow and grow. Was I, was I happy that they weren't thrown behind bars for 30 years? Yeah, I'm happy that that's not the, the practice anymore to a large extent. But is the answer to allow for civilization to implode upon itself in the name of liberty? To me, the answer is not that. It is not that simple. It really hasn't been that simple ever. There has to be more to this analysis. There has to be, you have to go deeper. You have to actually hear people. Like this is, we always get accused of being overly autistic, right? Well, I think part of autism is not, not actually listening to your opponent in a conversation or a debate. Not actually like contending with their contentions that this is destroying civilization because they're not wrong. If you walk around Los Angeles or if you walk around some of the craziest streets in San Francisco, you can come to no other conclusion other than this is a catastrophe. But that doesn't mean that the answer is to take nonviolent drug offenders and put them in prison for 30 years. The answer is far more complex. I already detailed it earlier. I won't do it again, but you get the point. We have to go deeper. We have to explain ourselves more thoroughly when it comes to the border, when it comes to drug addiction, when it comes to homelessness, when it comes to public property, when it comes to the military industrial complex, when it comes to the CIA, the FBI. Why? Why are we for abolition? Why? 
It's not that it's not that we want to commit crimes. That's not why we oppose spying, right? It's because we want privacy. It's not because we're criminals. It's because we're not criminals and we shouldn't be treated as for criminals. Like these are, these are things that require explanation because the vast majority of people don't share our worldview. Sorry for the lecture. I'll stop. Let's listen to more Tucker. <laughs> Russia has been rebuffed by the West. I mean, Vladimir Putin, this is not, I'm not flacking for Putin. I'm an American. I'm not going to live in Russia. I don't love Vladimir Putin. I'm, I'm stating the facts. At, he asked Bill Clinton to join NATO. He yes. tried to make a missile deal. He mentioned with, this in the interview. He did. Yes. That's yes. correct. Yes. And he's mentioned it in other forums as well. And NATO said, no, we don't want you. Now, if the point of NATO, not if, the point of NATO originally, of course, the post-war goal of NATO was to keep the Russians, the Soviets, from coming into Western Europe. It was a bulwark against the Russians. So if the Russians asked you to join the alliance, that would suggest you have solved the problem and you can move on to do something constructive with your life. But we refused. And so, I mean, just meditate on that. Go sit in the sauna for an hour and think about what that means. Very important point. And actually, I had a clip when I was on Timcast IRL about actually about a year ago now. I had just finished reading Scott Horton's latest masterpiece that is still not released called Provoked um, that gives the entire history of the not just the Russia-Ukraine war, but really how it came to pass uh, expansion post 91 after the fall of the USSR. And I, I do this three minute rant. It's still my pin tweet at Liberty Lockpot if you want to go watch it. So Tucker's analysis there is really important. And it's really, really important that his audience to the tunes of hundreds of millions of people are hearing it. That yes, Vladimir Putin, as well as other leaders, I think uh, I'm blanking on his name, not Gorbachev, the guy after him. Anyways, doesn't matter. They, they asked to be added to NATO. <clears throat> they said, look, Cold War's over. Let's go. And the Clinton administration, as I described on that Timcast rant, they laughed him off. They said, we'll pass. Not interested. The explicit purpose of NATO to prevent Russia from threatening Western Europe. Russia didn't want to threaten Western Europe. They wanted to stop. They wanted to end that, that standoff. They wanted to move forward. And, and I think Tucker's point is, you know, he says, go in the sauna, reflect on this. You should. You should absolutely do that. <clears throat> I, when, I, when I was reading Scott's book, that's all I did. All I did was reflect on what the fuck happened. You had an opportunity to take the largest nuclear power off of the, the any, enemy side of the map and put him into the, to the civilized, we're not going to blow up the world part of the map, assuming that's what the West is, which I'm not so sure it is anymore. But... We had that opportunity and they didn't take it. And now, now look at where we are. And I think that the answer, if you reflect on it, is that they wanted a perennial enemy. That, that exactly as Eisenhower warned, that the military industrial complex's claws are too deeply into our political establishment and that they are not interested in peace, that they want forever wars, that they want global domination, not cooperation. That's, that's what they've been about for decades. Contrary to the benefits or the desires or the demands of the American people or the people of the world. They're not interested in that. That's not their primary driving concern. And I'm not even sure it's on the list of their concerns, aside from assuaging us adequately so that we don't revolt. That's really the only concerns that they have for us at all. I know that sounds dark, and in some ways it is. But I think it's very important that we realize this is the this is the mindset. This is the worldview of the people that rule over us. They are not interested in peace and prosperity. They are interested in conquest and monopolization. They want to have everything, all of the resources, the assets, the capacity to print wealth. They want the power and they want total, total global global dominance. And your liberties are not even on their list of concerns. And if you didn't believe me, in 2019, after 2020, I'm pretty sure more of you will believe me. I, I can't overstate how incapacitated Joe Biden is. That's not an attack. That is a fact. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. So these are not decisions Joe Biden is making. But there are capable people around Biden, and I know them. What they lack is any perspective at all. So a conversation with a U.S. policymaker about the history of the region would begin and end with a conversation about, of course, 
Chamberlain and Churchill and Hitler, period. So the American policymaker historical template is tiny. In fact, there's only one. And it's a two year period in the late 1930s. And everything is based on that understanding of history and human nature. And that's insane. And so actually, American policymakers have convinced themselves that Vladimir Putin is gonna take over Poland. And it is not a defense of Putin. I don't mean to defend Putin. I'm not a fan of Putin's and I'm not a subject of Putin's. I'm an American. However, there's no evidence that Putin has any interest in expanding his borders. He is the largest country in the world and it's very hard to run. They don't need natural resources. There's nothing in Poland he wants. There's nothing he will gain by taking Poland other than more trouble. Uh, that is, here, if here, you're saying here, that he's here, gonna invade here, Poland, here, you don't know what you're talking here, about. Here is a point, a point in the interview when you asked him, are you, are you ready to, to invade Poland? Are you an expansionist uh, power? Expansion, yeah. yes, in, in, in Poland. He said only if Poland launched a war of course. on Russia, okay? Ukraine did not launch a war on Russia and he invaded Ukraine. Why you didn't follow up on this question? <laughs> I started with that question, actually. Um, but he treated me to 35 minutes of Catherine the Great Okay. And the Rus. Uh, but no, the core question is why did he move his forces into Eastern Ukraine? Mm. And I watched this from a distant vantage in the United States. And I watched the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, go to the Munich Security Conference just days before that in February of 2022 and say in a public forum at a press conference to Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, we want you to join NATO which is another way of saying it's a synonym for we plan to put nuclear weapons on Russia. We think there's no debate for, for those that think that Tucker may be overstating it, that uh, Kamala Harris would never do such a thing, especially when Russia was already staging on their border, uh, on the Ukrainian border. I appreciate uh, and admire President Zelensky's desire to join NATO. And one of, again, the founding principles of NATO is that each country must have the ability, unimpaired, unimpeded, to determine their own future, both in terms of their form of government, and in this case, whether they desire to be a member of NATO. And I'll put that in context because the obvious is also the point, which is that, and therefore no other country can tell anyone whether they should or should not join NATO. That should be their independent choice. That is the point of sovereignty. So I respect President Zelensky's desire to be a member of NATO. So there you have it. Did Tucker lie? Or was he telling the exact truth? And this has actually been a point I've highlighted many times, that this was intentionally provocative. The State Department is obviously Kamala and Biden and everybody else. They all knew the reddest of red lines. It was told to Burns, the current CIA director, when he was talking to Condoleezza Rice over a decade ago. They knew. Reddest of red lines. Ukraine cannot be added to NATO. If they intend to, it will ultimately amount in Russia's or amount to Russia invading Ukraine to prevent it. And here's the really tragic part about it. Under the NATO uh, guidelines, you have to not have any border disputes. Ukraine could not have been added to NATO, regardless of what Kamala was saying there, because Crimea was obviously in dispute at that time. So it didn't need to be said. It didn't need to be, uh, the situation didn't need to be exacerbated. But they opted to, because as I said, if you want to go back and watch my episode over a year ago, the war they wanted, this was the war that they wanted. Does that justify Putin? Does that make him the good guy? Does that mean that his every grievance he has is just and righteous and that we stand with Putin? No, it doesn't mean any of that. It just means that the American State Department also has blood on its hands, that they wanted this war to happen. And for that reason, you ought to oppose it and be calling for a ceasefire, regardless of where the new boundaries in Ukraine are going to be drawn. It is not to the American people's best interest to continue to bankrupt ourselves in hopes of driving back Russia. It's not going to happen unless you're willing to put U.S. and NATO troops on the ground, in which case you are advocating on behalf of a world war. And I would encourage you to reconsider that especially if you're a fighting age male, because you will be on that front line. Not a good idea. But Tucker's telling the truth. 
this was the provocation and and this is this is exactly the point i've i've I, this is the moment i've pointed to over and over again that this was just a few months before russia invaded that she went over there she talked to the uh, stoltenberg who's the head of of nato said our 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 bond with nato is you know limitless and blah 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 and ultimately ukraine has every right to join and i respect and appreciate uh, Vladimir Zelensky's desire to be added to it. They wanted it, man. They absolutely did. It just tells you how constipated and restricted and censored the U.S. media landscape is, that I was the only one who said that. Well, wait a second. The purpose of diplomacy is to reach a peaceful, mutually one hopes beneficial conclusion to a crisis. So if you're showing up voluntarily at the Munich Security Conference and saying, hey, Zelensky, why don't you allow us to put nuclear weapons on Russia's border? You're cruising for a war because you know that's the red line. Because Putin has said that, and any close observer now, of the area now, already knows now, that. Now, do you have an explanation, a reasonable explanation, no. why there is this anti-war and this very negative remarks about this interview from a lot of your colleagues and a lot of politicians in the world? One of the ways that I, I think I'm different is I don't like the internet, and um, I haven't seen any of the reaction, and I would imagine you know, I'm not the most popular person among my colleagues in the United States. I wouldn't have dinner with them anyway, so it's no great loss. But, um, you know, they, I, I can't imagine what their motives would be. I didn't go to Russia, of course, to promote Vladimir Putin. And if, I, if that was my purpose, I'd say so, because I'm not embarrassed. I went because I felt that most Americans, in whose name all of this is being done, don't really know what's happening, and they know nothing about the guy they're supposedly at war with in, uh, unofficially. And I just felt that my job, if I have a job in this world, it's to bring information to people so they can decide. And so I wanted to do the longest interview I could with Vladimir Putin that contained the most amount of Vladimir Putin talking, not me grandstanding about what a great person I am. When an American journalist interviews someone like Vladimir Putin, the whole point of the interview is to say, I'm a good person and you're not. And that interview was aimed at his colleagues in the newsrooms in the United States. I'm a good person. Why are you such a bad person? You're committing genocide. Okay. That's not fruitful, and that's certainly not my role. I care what God thinks of me, what my wife thinks of me, and what my four children think of me, and that's all I care about. So I don't need to prove that I'm a good person. I want to hear Vladimir Putin talk so people in my country can assess what's happening. Uh, uh, that's uh, it. Uh, that press restriction is universal in the United States. I know because I've lived it. I've you know, asked my former, you know, I, I've had a lot of jobs. Um, and I've done this for 34 years, and I know how it works. And um, there's more censorship in Russia than there is in the United States, but there's a great deal in the United States. And so, you know, at a certain point, it's like people can decide whether they think, you know, what, what countries they think are better, what systems they think Sir, are better. I, I, I just I, want to know what he thinks. That was yes, the whole point. Yes. I was very surprised uh, about an inappropriate remark. I don't think it is, contains any of the uh, what you can call jaunties or uh, niceties from uh, Mrs. Clinton when she mentioned uh, a phrase about you. I don't want to repeat it. Oh, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Don't worry. You didn't. She's say a it. child. I don't listen to her. No, uh, no. How's Libya doing? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> oh, okay. She, she said uh, uh, the, 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 the useful idiot. Media information in a free country is a counterbalance against entrenched power, not just government power, but the economic power, business. It, it, it was in my country constitutionally. It is des it is designed to be to serve as a counterbalance to that. So if sources of information, media outlets align with entrenched power, then you have a powerless population, and it's totalitarian. And that is very quickly the direction the United States is headed. And and I do think that technology abets this progression and machine learning especially. And so it's a perilous moment if if it you know we're a democracy purportedly. And a prerequisite for democracy is information so that the electorate can make up its mind and decide who to choose. And so if you don't have access to information, you don't have democracy. And we're in this sort of weird spiral where our leaders lecture us ever more about democracy and how sacred it is, even as they choke it off, choke it to death. And so I think the people who provide information, who bring the facts to the public, have a critical role to play. And right now it's difficult. I'm not facing any great, I, I don't mean to cast myself as a hero. I'm certainly not a hero at all. Um, but I do think it's tougher and tougher to do that. Sir, and that means we have a greater obligation to do it. Sir, do you have an explanation till this moment since the Gaza events took place? Till now, nobody came out and said how on earth the United States of America 
is vetoing the, the stoppage of uh, fire, how a country would veto not to continue war, how, how, how somebody is against stopping a war. The United States is, for this moment, is the most powerful country in the history of the world. So if you were to frame this in terms we're all familiar with, which are the most basic terms, the terms of the family, the United States would be dad, it would be the father. And the father's sacred obligation is to protect his family and to restore peace within his walls. So if I come home, I have four children, if I come home from work and two of my kids are fighting, what's the first thing I do? Even before I assess why they're fighting, before I gather the facts and know what's happening. I, I stop the fight. I stop fighting. Yes. So if I come home and I have two kids fighting and I say, go, go, put the crap out of them. I am evil because I have violated the most basic duty of fatherhood, which is to bring peace because I have the power. I'm the only one who can bring peace. And so if you see a nation with awesome power abetting war for its own sake, you have a leadership that has no moral authority, that is illegitimate. And I mean that too. And, I, and I, not, I'm not even referring to any specific region or conflict. I mean generally. And I'm deeply offended by that. Deeply. Um, and, and it's something that I try to express, and I'm often called a traitor for saying that. It's the opposite. I say that because I believe in the United States. I think it's a moral, it has been a morally superior country. And if we allow our leaders to use our power to spread destruction for its own sake, that is shameful. It's a binary, okay? It's a, it's a black and white. It's a zero and a one. You are either creating or you're destroying. You're improving or you're degrading. And that's how you know whether something is good or bad, whether it's virtuous or evil. If you just judge the fruits, <laughs> by its fruits you will know it. Uh, and, I, and I'm very distressed and concerned that we are entering an era where this awesome force for good is instead being used for evil. Just beautiful, heartfelt, sincere, real. And I am so appreciative that someone of his stature, someone with his audience is willing to say it. I mean, this is really anti-war 101. And for those that, you know, first off, for those that aren't aware, the reason that this is being brought up is because the Security Council the United States vetoed a ceasefire demand from the Security Council. Uh, you know, whether or not Israel would have listened to it, they probably wouldn't have. But the fact that America, having veto power and vetoing a ceasefire between the Palestinians and the Israelis, is genuinely morally reprehensible. And I think that this, you know, despite the fact that he may be assessing this from kind of a paternalistic the U.S. being the, the father of the planet, and I don't really agree with that, but in reality, that's kind of what it is in the sense that America does have that power to veto what, what would have saved a lot of lives had it actually been enforced or, or listened to by the Israelis. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to witness, and I think that, that his, his logical deduction is flawless, that if you have a government that is willing to continue to perpetuate death and destruction for their own ends against the benefits of the people involved or of the American people, well, then that government is illegitimate. Now, the only thing I would really disagree with Tucker on is that the U U.S. empire has been this benevolent overlord for up until now, I think. Quite clearly, that's not the case. It, you, we can argue if it ever was or if it stopped in the 1900s or 2003, whatever your demarcation point. I think the other thing that libertarians get wrong oftentimes is when people finally come to their, their senses and come to our, our perspective on these endless wars that we go, oh, about time. I can't tell you, every, every time I say anything online, I always get someone who replies with, Oh, you just figured that out? <laughs> Catch up. Oh, you're slow, bro. It's like, look, oftentimes I'm saying things that I've already known because I'm trying to get more people into our camp. So you just come off like an asshole because you're talking to me. But also, it's not helpful. Like, what if this was a revelatory moment? And I was just like, this is, this is an epiphany. This is the first time I've actually had this thought that the Empire is immoral and unjust. And you come along and just go... You're fucking slow as shit, dude. It's like, okay, thanks, I guess.
glad that I've seen the light. Really encouraging. I'm going to definitely continue to listen to you moving forward. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to block you and never, never think of you again. I, for one, despite the fact that, yes, I think that Tucker's analysis and his epiphany could have been received decades prior, who gives a fuck? He's realizing it now when it matters, when it matters the most. That when we're on the precipice of world war, he's saying, I see this for the first time. I see clearly this is an illegitimate government. That's profound that a, that a guy with his audience, hundreds of millions of people that watched him just a week ago and tens of millions that will probably watch the interview I'm playing for you today, not to mention all the people that are chopping it up and doing what I'm doing right now. That's tremendously impactful. It's, it's reason for real hope and optimism that the people of the world, even those that had stood by and believed in kind of this paternalistic analysis of the government uh, of the U.S. government's empirical role on on Earth are now realizing that it's been at minimum. They have strayed from the benevolent overlord path that they were on. And now what they're doing is objectively evil very very profound analysis from tucker and i am so so appreciative that uh so many people are going to hear it when you ask him a question if he doesn't have an answer to tell me actually i don't know the answer of this question i've never heard a leader of anything whether it's a country or a company or a soccer team ever in my life in a life spent interviewing people i've never heard a single one of them say you know i don't i don't know the answer it's very complicated i haven't figured it out i've never heard anybody say that and to me, that is the, the purest sign of wisdom, because wisdom grows from humility. Wisdom grows from the recognition that you are not God. And in the United States, we had a period where we were sort of you know, having this debate about, are some religions good and some religions bad? I'll tell you my view on it, and it's a hardened view. It's a sincere view. I divide the world not between Muslim, Jew, and Christian, or Buddhist. I divide the world between people who believe they're God and people who know they're not. And the only people I trust are in the second category, because that is the beginning of wisdom. When you know you are not God, that you cannot affect every change that you want, that you can't foresee the future, that you're not omnipotent, then you are much more likely to make good decisions, wise, humane decisions. By contrast, when you believe you have the power to shape the world and other people, as we were hearing this morning through, through you know, biohacking, um, when you think you can create a better human being through technology, you're very dangerous because you don't understand your own limits. And you will get a lot of people killed uh, when, you, when you have those false beliefs, in my opinion. Well, I've never done that much of a video or watched that much of a video and, and reacted with you guys, but I just thought it from start to finish was unbelievably powerful. And I hope you agree. I hope that it was valuable to you too. I think that it... it it offers a, a lot of reason for hope that that people of great influence, the Joe Rogans, the Tucker Carlson's, uh, even the Dave Smith's of the world, uh, that that more and more our message that this government is illegitimate, that we ought to avoid war, that we ought to focus on individual rights and outcomes for individuals versus the collective, that bioengineering and all this stuff and, and uh, kind of a, a belief in technocracy and omnipotence of the state or omnipotence of these individuals who believe that they're gods. I think that all of that is really important to internalize and to to recognize that like that's that's what we're up against. It really is those that that understand that they aren't God versus those that think they are incorrectly. Good, good lesson in humility while we're at it on top of a bunch of beautiful messages all intertwined into one. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. If you did, please hit the like button, share it around, subscribe. If you want to support my work, you can subscribe on X at Liberty Lockpod or you can go to libertylockdown.locals.com, sign up to become a supporting member of the show. Uh, I'll do an AMA over there if you guys would like me to, just drop it in the comments below and uh, continue to leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. What else? You can get uh, new Liberty Lockdown merch over at toplobster.com. I also do the best political show with Luke Radowski, and uh, that's usually three nights a week live over on Rumble. All one word, we are change. What else? I do Tower Gang. You shouldn't subscribe to that. <laughs> that's that's it. That's all. Um, 
I'm hopeful. I still am. I think that uh, that we're headed in the right direction. And as long as people like you uh, continue to speak out, whether you're sharing my show or not, as long as you're inspired, uh, I think that that's the main thing that I respect about Tucker Carlson is that he's clearly he's seeing the danger before him and he's not running from it. He's running towards it. And I think that if if more of us do that, we have a real chance of prevailing. And if not of not enough of us do, then truly hope is lost. So uh, run towards it, ladies and gentlemen. See you soon. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go?